Rome did not convert to Christianity, but rather Christianity converted to Rome. Our life mission is to win converted Jews back home. And I want to start with a question that struck me. And now this is Christmas and Hanukkah. And nowadays we see that the spirit of Christmas is coming into the gist of, of Israeli life. So you can see Christmas tree all around Tel Aviv. And you have Merry Hanukkah parties. And you have many, many parties that combine together Christmas with Hanukkah. So we had Novigod in the, like 20 years ago, and people said, mm, this is not a religious holiday. This is a Russian holiday. But now this is pure Christmas. You go to Sawana Market in Tel Aviv, this is Christmas. You go to Jerusalem, even the Israelis, the Jews go to celebrate Christmas. And my question, my first question is, do you consider this part of going to the culture of Greece, going to the culture of Mityavnim? Or do you think that someone is standing behind this trend and putting money, put money to enforce the idea of Christmas in Israel? I am very fortunate that I live in an area called Levi Yerushalayim, and I have not seen a Christmas tree. I'm very glad I made Aliyah to where I live in Yerushalayim rather than Tel Aviv, based on what you're telling me. So as it turns out, the Christmas worship, which is nowhere found in the Christian Bible, not only is Christmas holiday nowhere to found in the New Testament, but Hanukkah is in the Christian Bible. It's in John chapter 10. Just a strange thing. But what is behind, what fuels Christmas is the pagan worship of the sun. And Christianity simply adopted all the pagan ideas, inculcated them, and therefore Rome did not convert to Christianity, but rather Christianity converted to Rome. It simply adopted all the pagan ideas. And in fact, a second century church father, whose name was Justin, very famous, lived in the middle of the second century, he even argued in his apologetic work uh, to, the Rome, to the Roman Empire, he said, but what we believe in is not very different than what you believe in, same ideas. But let's talk about it, because when he was around, there was no Christmas. We even find the Christmas tree clearly forbidden in Tanakh. Now, what's behind? What are you talking about a Christmas tree? Well, as it turns out, why is December 25th celebrated with wild festivities throughout the Roman Empire before Christianity? Because if you worship the sun, and the sun was always the god behind all the avoid desire, the foreign worship. I mean, it's not an accident that Christianity would adopt Sunday as their Shabbat rather than the seventh day. What is behind it? Well, if you worship the sun, the winter was something that was very frightening because your God was receding. The nights are getting longer and the days shorter. But something began to happen around December 25th. An accurate clock is a rather relatively modern invention, but they realize at this point in the year that finally the days are getting longer and the nights are, are getting shorter. And they would celebrate this with wild festivities. And that's why there's a Christmas tree. What kind of tree is used in a Christmas tree? The evergreen tree. What's striking about that tree? Its leaves remain green. That's why it's called evergreen even during the winter, whereas other trees, all the leaves die and fall off, they turn brown. Evergreen means it, and that's the god called Sol Invictus. That's what's right behind this idolatry of Christianity, in that this tree made it, so therefore what we're going to do is we're going to take one of these trees in from the forest, 
chop it down and bring it into our house because we see the sign from heaven. And if you think I'm making this up, go to Jeremiah chapter 10. Openly, Jeremiah says, warns the children of Israel, do not learn the ways of the nations of the world. Do not do what the nations do. What do they do? They First of all, they look at the heavens and they're terrified of the sign they see. What are they afraid of? They're afraid because the nights are getting longer during the winter. And this causes them to shudder, the Navi says. Look at verse 3. The practices of these nations of the world is worthless. What do they do? Verse 3. Now, Jeremiah, in case you don't know this, Jeremiah lived 500 years before Christianity. Jeremiah lived at the end of the first temple period. He says they cut a tree out of the forest like a craftsman cuts with a chisel. And what do they do? They adorn it with silver and gold. They take a hammer and nails, and they make sure that it doesn't move. They literally take a tree from the forest, bring it into their house, nail it down because it's no longer in the root, and they put gold and silver on it. And Jeremiah who says that this is the practice of the nations of the world, and don't do such a thing. So what happened was Christianity simply adopted a well-known festivity to mock the birth of the Son of God. And that's why when you see ancient paintings of Jesus and Mary, they all have the sun halo behind them. That's Sol Invictus. Sol Invictus is the Latin term for the inconquerable sun. So this is pure idolatry, pure avoidazara, and the church would adopt this. Also, and the first time we see a worship of Christmas is in 336. Right? And that's very important because that's essentially a decade after the Council of Nicaea. That's after the Christianity became an officially recognized religion in the Roman Empire under Constantine. And then we see the celebration of Christmas. So they simply accommodated that. And at the same time in the fourth century, Christianity rejected the Jewish calendar. It's not an accident. What does that mean? That Easter in the second century was celebrated by Christians on Pesach. In fact, in many um, cultures, Easter is called Pascha. And, and Polycarp and many other church fathers celebrate Easter based on when the Jews said it's Passover, right? And there was a... and. Th- they changed that, so it was all, and they changed Easter celebration to uh, the vernal equinox. So that's what that's what Christmas is. So this is what was prophesized in Daniel seven with the fourth monster, right? With very the- good. That's very good. I hope your viewers understand what, what your wife just said. That's mind blowing. What this woman just said. That's Daniel chapter seven, verse twenty three and twenty four. I, Daniel's having conversation with an angel. The four kingdoms. The fourth, the fourth kingdom. He doesn't re- recognize it. He says the first one is Babylon. The second one is Persia. The, the third one is Greece. What is that fourth one? That's Rome, and that's Christianity. Right. That's Christendom, but it morphs. It has ten horns and then a little horn. Right. What are the ten horns? It's mind-blowing. If you start counting all the emperors of Rome, but you have to include Julius Caesar as an emperor, although technically he wasn't, but he's the leader of Rome. So from the time of Julius Caesar until we get to the Roman emperor who was presided over the destruction of the Second Temple, you have exactly ten emperors of Rome. And then you have the little emperor who emerged and that's Titus, and that's mind-blowing, right? But the key point about Daniel 7, verse 24 and 25 is the identifying feature of this last kingdom is they would do two things. They would change the times, and they would change the law. They change the time, they change the calendar. It's a chutzpah to do that. And second, they change the laws. And that's all contained in Colossians 2, 16 and 17. Openly, Paul says, so it's not like the Romans invented this. Paul says, don't let anybody tell you about what you eat, what you drink, your holidays, your new moons. 
your Sabbaths, because all those laws are really a shadow and the essence is Christ. It literally says that. So yeah, they did it. Very good. Brilliant.